Hypothetically, if a nuke hits New York, what happens to the bodies? Over the course of our lesson, I'll be drawing upon the work of several fantastic YouTubers, including Kurz Gazette, Neil Holloran, The Infographic Show, and Kyle Hill, among others, as well as various conventional sources, as we attempt to deepen our understanding of the effect caused by nuclear explosions on human anatomy. It's enormous, it's extraordinary to, uh, to set eyes upon. And also deadly. Please remember that this is an educational video, and though disturbing to some, all depictions of trauma are carefully contextualized within a lesson on human anatomy in accordance with YouTube's community guidelines. As you might expect, the damage causes changes depending on a victim's distance from the epicenter of the blast. The closer you are to ground zero, the lower your chances of survival. But even for those further away, there are many dangers to contend with. Using NukeMap, an online nuclear weapons effect simulator, will simulate a detonation over lower Manhattan, New York, then examine the dangers as we move away from the blast. The software's creator, Dr. Alex Wellerstein, a nuclear historian at Stevens Institute of Technology, will join us periodically to help us make sense of the data. What would you do if a nuclear weapon went off nearby, say in Manhattan? And they say, well, I wouldn't have to do anything, right? I'd just be dead. Morbid, but as Dr. Wellerstein goes on to explain. I want to talk to you today about why that's not entirely a true fact. Since, believe it or not, there are some simple steps that might be taken in the event of a nuclear blast by those further away from ground zero to increase their chances of survival. There might be some very good reasons to start thinking about this in a very serious and practical way. Well, that's one hell of a first slide, Professor. Yet, as international tensions rise, you may have a point. In fact, many powerful countries have a frightening arsenal, as shown in this graphic by Pie Chart Pirate. And obviously, with the recent success of Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer, the possibility of nuclear warfare looms in the global consciousness. You are the man who gave them the power to destroy themselves and the world is not prepared. In the film, we witness Oppenheimer's internal conflict as he researches and creates the atomic bomb. The same was true in real life, especially after the detonations. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Obviously, his doubts were, and still are warranted. And the terrifying effects of his creations, though only used twice in combat, are very well documented. In 2020, Dr. Wellerstein wrote an article that gives us a general estimate of the casualties suffered at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The most credible estimates cluster around a low of 110,000 mortalities and a high of 210,000, an enormous gap. Add to this the tens of thousands of people who were injured in blasts, though this number is also an equally contentious figure. And yet, the bombs dropped in Japan in 1945 were much smaller than what could be deployed today. Have a look at these animations from Learn From The Base YouTube channel. Little Boy, dropped on Hiroshima on August 6th, 1945, exploded with the energy of approximately 15 kilotons of TNT. Three days later, on August 9th of 1945, Fat Man was dropped on Nagasaki, unleashing 21 kilotons of destruction on the city and its inhabitants. If you've never seen the US Army photos taken at Hiroshima before and after the blast, the effect is staggering. Frightening though they may be, these images betray the extent of the horror suffered by those on the ground. And to think that in October 30th, 1961, the Soviet Union tested the Tsar bomb, measuring a humble 50,000 kilotons. While the Tsar bomb is the largest man-made explosion, many other powerful weapons have also been tested. For context, all of the ones pictured in this graphic by the Visual Capitalist are larger than Mount Everest. The scale of these weapons is difficult to wrap your head around, not to mention the fact that a person must actually press a button to launch one. Thankfully, today is only a simulation. We'll assume the bomb is detonated in the air. 
to maximize the radius of impact. Now this animation from Neil Horan's video, Simulation of a Nuclear Blast on a Major City, is a helpful visual. This airburst technique was deployed in Japan at both Hiroshima and Nagasaki, where the bomb was detonated approximately 500 meters above the ground. It creates a wider blast radius, increased shockwave effects, and reduced ground fallout compared to detonating it on the ground a ground burst, making it more effective against a larger area while minimizing radioactive fallout. But here we'll use an 800 kiloton warhead, a relatively large bomb in today's arsenals, and a hundred times more powerful than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Right, so 800 kilotons and 500 meters above the ground. We'll request an estimate of the number of casualties, but leave the radioactive fallout option unchecked for now. Don't worry, we'll come back to that later. Before we get our boots on the ground, we'll have to address the big bold elephants in the room, casualties and injuries. Dr. Wellerstein left a note in fine print, which states, modeling casualties from a nuclear attack is difficult. These numbers should be seen as evocative, not definitive. And I can see why. From a medical standpoint, there are four major types of damage caused by a nuclear explosion, all of which could kill you, but depending on the severity or dose, might not. Over the course of this video, we'll become acquainted with the following factors. Thermal radiation, damage from the intense heat and light. Ionizing radiation damage, which includes immediate and prompt radiation effects. Blast damage from the shock wave and high pressure wave. Residual radiation from radioactive fallout, causing long-term radiation hazards. It should also be noted that depending on the victim's proximity to ground zero, one of these variables will cause more damage than the others, even though all of them could simultaneously present to some degree. Don't worry, this will become clear over the course of our lesson. Now, we turn back to Neil Horan's simulation for a visualization of the blast. Upon detonation, a fireball as hot as the sun would expand to a radius of 800 meters. The nuclear firewall is thermal radiation in the extreme, represented by the innermost circle on our map. And as Dr. Wellerstein explains, that is an area of immense pressure and immense heat. If that goes off on top of you, you're dead. I'm sorry, there's no, nothing you can do about that. If you wanna think about people being vaporized in there, yeah, sure, you'll be vaporized. The term vaporized is, well, accurate. And as a result, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we are left with shadows. In a recent article, Dr. Michael Hartshorn, a professor of radiology at the University of New Mexico explained, when each bomb exploded, the intense light and heat spread out from the point of implosion. Objects and people in its path shielded objects behind them by absorbing the light and energy. The surrounding light bleached the concrete or stone around the shadow. The thermal radiation emitted by the nuclear fireball consists of high energy photons, primarily in the form of visible light and infrared radiation. Thus, it travels at the speed of light. And when it strikes a surface, it transfers its energy, causing rapid heating. Anything in the line of sight of the fireball would have absorbed this energy. And as the Kurzgesagt team put it, Think of water dripped onto a very hot pan. A sizzle, and then there's nothing. Damn. I mean, yeah. Up to 60% of the adult human body is water. And at the atomic level, when you really break it down, approximately 99% of our bodies are composed of only six elements. Oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, carbon, calcium, and phosphorus. This becomes especially apparent when we are exposed to a powerful enough energy source, like say, a nuclear fireball. The molecules in the body dissociate, that is to say, the chemical bonds between them are <coughs> broken, then the individual atoms become ionized, losing electrons and becoming super hot ions, like those present in the sun's plasma. Okay, so we write those couple blocks off. The intersection of physics and biology can be an unforgiving place. And the little baby sun birthed so violently in the middle of Manhattan is just getting started. An intense tsunami of light washes over the city in an instant. If you happen to have your head pointed in the direction of the explosion, it renders you blind for a few hours. Bright light can blind us temporarily by overwhelming the cells in our eyes that detect light, specifically the photoreceptor cells called cones, making them less responsive and causing our pupils to constrict to protect the retina. This can lead to reduced contrast sensitivity and glare. 
over time, the photoreceptors can recover, but unfortunately, the flash of the light is the least of our worries. The heat of this light produces a thermal pulse, so energetic and hot that it just burns everything as far as 13 kilometers from the detonation site. A quick look at Nuke map tells us that within this range, third degree nerves extend throughout the layers of the skin and are often painless because they destroy the pain nerves. They can cause severe scarring or disablement and can require amputation. 100% probability for third degree burns that this yield is 11.2 calories per square centimeter. The value of 11.2 calories per square centimeter refers to the amount of energy absorbed per square centimeter of the surface, in this case human tissue, when exposed to thermal radiation. Every exposed tissue within an 11 kilometer radius. If you happen to be in reach of the thermal pulse, one moment you're on your way to work, the next moment you're on fire. Instantaneously. We're talking about the speed of light after all. While several common building materials can provide varying degrees of protection against the thermal radiation from a nuclear blast, thick concrete walls, reflective roofing, your safest bet is probably to be underground in a subway tunnel or bunker of some sort, shielded by a layer of earth, soil, and perhaps thick man-made structures. Avoiding the heat won't do much good if a skyscraper collapses on top of you, but we'll talk about debris and rubble a little later on. Let's address the victims bearing the brunt of the thermal pulse. We have three layers of skin the epidermis, the top layer, the dermis, the middle layer, and the hypodermis, deepest fatty layer. And a third degree burn damages all three. The outermost layer of the skin is the epidermis, which provides protection and acts as a barrier against the external environment. The hypodermis, or innermost layer, also known as subcutaneous tissue, contains fat cells, blood vessels, and deeper structures. But I'd like to turn your attention for a moment to the middle layer. You see, the dermis plays a crucial role in supporting the epidermis and housing important structures like blood vessels, hair follicles, sweat glands, and most notably, nerve endings. And yes, if a nerve ending is destroyed, there is no feeling in the associated area. But unless the entire body is burned, there will always be a transition from necrotic or dead tissue towards tissue with viable nerve endings, where pain would have been unimaginable. I still remember the day very well because this was a river filled with the dead bodies. People were burned and they jumped into the river. Conceivably, in a desperate attempt to ease the pain. Unfortunately, in the aftermath of a nuclear strike, medical attention wouldn't be forthcoming, with nearby hospitals overwhelmed, medical personnel among the casualties or injured, and compromised city infrastructure and radiation danger severely limiting outreach. Without prompt medical attention, many burn victims would succumb to their injuries. The most likely cause of death could be a combination of factors, including severe fluid loss, electrolyte imbalances, infection, and systemic inflammatory response. These factors can lead to dehydration, organ failure, and sepsis, where a localized infection spreads throughout the body. I was surrounded by... Eight-year-old Keiko Ogura saw them with her own eyes. Horrors she can never forget. Before we hear another first-hand account from a survivor named Keiko, the BBC interviewer goes on to explain... Outside her house, the survivors began to gather. Their faces burned and swollen. They begged for water. Again, severe dehydration is one of the myriad of issues requiring urgent care. While awaiting aid, many victims are left to fend for themselves. Their skin was peeling off and hanging. I thought they were and, uh, holding something or the rag or something, but that was really skin. Typically during treatment, any of this non-viable tissue will be removed and wounds cleaned and dressed in an effort to reduce the risk of complications, prevent infection, promote healing and minimize long-term damage. Skin grafting may be necessary to replace damaged skin with healthy skin from another part of the body, autograft, or from a donor source, allograft, and can minimize but not eliminate scars which many victims carry for life. This color footage of victims taken in 1946 was classified until the 1980s. Keloid scars like these form due to an overproduction of collagen during the healing process, resulting in raised and larger than normal scars that extend beyond the original wound. While excess tissue may be a byproduct of the healing process for some victims, 
Amputation may be part of successful treatment plan for others, as the removal of severely damaged tissue can further prevent infection and improve the chances of healing. But what do you amputate? When a large percentage of body tissues has been burnt evenly, as was the case with many victims. This quote from a survivor in Time Magazine article speaks for itself. One incident I will never forget is cremating my father. My brothers and I gently laid his blackened, swollen body atop a burnt beam in front of a factory where we found him dead and set him alight. May he and the other victims rest in peace. Once tissue is necrotic and black, there is no saving it. Since we know that the burns of this severity indicate the possibility of deep tissue and internal damage, it follows that if a large portion of the skin, say 50%, is charred black, it is unlikely that the patient can be saved. Thankfully, beyond the 11 kilometer range, the risk of thermal radiation burn damage reduces significantly. On the other hand, for those within a 2.38 kilometer radius of our simulated blast, at the same moment that the bodies are overcome by thermal radiation, they are also hit with a life-threatening dose of ionizing radiation, approximately 500 rem, which also travels at the speed of light. Remkin Equivalent Man, or REM for short, is a unit used to measure the biological impact of ionizing radiation on human health. Concrete walls, several inches thick, or lead shielding could offer some reduction in radiation exposure, but might not completely eliminate the risk. So here again, you'd better hope you're underground when the bomb drops. Think of ionizing radiation as high energy waves that can strip electrons from atoms, potentially damaging cells and DNA. You know, dismantle our biological building blocks from the inside out. Thus, the damage caused by ionizing radiation can lead to mutations in DNA, cell death, and other cellular changes that can in turn may cause cancer and other diseases. The intensity of these waves decrease as you move further away from the source. And literally half a kilometer further away, the dose is reduced to 100 rem, which although sickness inducing, carries less than a 5% chance of death in 60 days. Though there is still an elevated cancer risk among survivors. But for learning purposes, let's step back into the jaws of the 500 rem beast, where the dose carries a 50 to 90% mortality without medical care, and is sufficient to cause both acute radiation syndrome, sometimes known as radiation sickness, and cutaneous radiation syndrome and radiation burns. Cutaneous radiation syndrome, or CRS, occurs in stages and encompasses a range of skin-related effects caused by ionizing radiation exposure, including reddening of the skin, skin damage, blistering, ulceration, and open sores, while radiation burns specifically refer to skin damage resulting from the direct impact of ionizing radiation. It should be noted that CRS can include radiation burns as part of its progression. Burns of this type can be more severe and challenging to treat than thermal burns for other reasons. They may have a delayed onset, appearing hours, days, or even weeks after exposure, and the damage can be deeper. Since both CRS and radiation burns involve ionizing radiation, they damage cells and and DNA at a molecular level, which can interfere with the body's ability to heal itself, while the compromised cellular environment can leave tissue more susceptible to infection. But as mentioned in the BBC documentary, radiation sickness has become the single most disturbing legacy of the bomb. Given the death and destruction caused by other factors, that is a bold claim. The main difference with radiation sickness, however, is the drawn out suffering of those affected by it. A mysterious illness began to spread. I noticed it from about the fourth day. But the eyewitness goes on. Of course, it had been there all along, but I thought people were dying of severe burns. Well, ARS is extremely sneaky. The CDC tells us the sickness occurs in four stages, during which it affects several main areas of the body. If you're familiar with the events of Chernobyl or the TV series by the same name, you may have heard the name of Vasily Ivanovich Ignatenko, the first firefighter at the power plant on that fateful day. Thankfully, the infographic show relates his journey through ARS with less graphic images to keep us focused on learning. The first stage, known as the prodromal stage, occurs between one hour and two days after exposure and is characterized by some combination of vomiting, nausea, diarrhea, confusion, loss of consciousness, and burning sensations in the skin. In the case of Ignatenko, he was excreting bloody loose stools around 25 times a day and at times he threw up bits of his internal organs. And and this may last for a couple of days until the patient's condition appears to improve. It was as if the sickness was abating. It wasn't. What was happening is that he was experiencing stage two of ARS, the latent stage. Right. 
So what follows is known as the latent stage, wherein stem cells in bone marrow and cells lying in the GI tract are dying, although patients may appear and feel well. Did you know that the bone marrow is essentially a factory that specializes in producing blood cells, both red and white? Red blood cells, erythrocytes, transport oxygen from the lungs to the rest of the body and return carbon dioxide to the lungs for exhalation. When their number decreases, so too does the blood's ability to carry oxygen and deliver it to various systems and tissues. This condition is called anemia and causes the body to feel tired and weak since tissues and organs require oxygen to carry out their metabolic processes and maintain their viability. And I mean, ultimately, without sufficient oxygen, a state known as hypoxia, tissues die. Hypoxia. When you don't have enough oxygen, things seem really silly. Meanwhile, white blood cells, or leukocytes, play a vital role in the immune system, defending the body against infections and foreign invaders. As their number decreases, so too does the body's ability to mount an effective immune response, resulting in an increased susceptibility to infections. You can imagine that in the hospital rooms, full to the brim to accommodate the wounded, with resources stretched thin, there would be a higher likelihood of infection spreading. Of course, if it did, our weakened patients are not equipped to fight it off. Then we come to the gastrointestinal tract. Under normal circumstances, the cells that line the GI tract are dividing and regenerating rapidly. This is because the GI tract is responsible for digesting food, absorbing nutrients, and providing a barrier against harmful substances. And in order to fulfill these functions effectively, its lining must be continually renewed. If these cells fail, the functions fail. The barrier is compromised, allowing bacteria and toxins to potentially enter the bloodstream. Say it with me, infection. And at a time when the immune system is already compromised, right? Our ability to absorb nutrients is also reduced and persistent nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea contribute to fluid, electrolyte imbalance, and dehydration. As all of these problems overtake the body, we are a stone's throw away from many fatal outcomes, including systemic inflammatory response, sepsis, and multi-organ dysfunction. And thus, the stage is set for the third phase of ARS, manifest illness. Let's check back in with the BBC and a woman whose husband fell victim to this phase. During this time, purple spots began breaking out all over my husband's body. He then vomited a large amount of brown liquid. He went limp and died an hour later. With its most vital functions falling, the body shut down. They were rotting. It was necrosis. In the end, the hair would start to fall out. When you put your hand on the patient's head, tufts of hair would come away in your hand. This is not something I'd wish upon my worst enemy. And worst of all, it cannot directly be treated. You cannot remove the radiation. Sure, antibiotics can help fight infection, while bone marrow transplants and blood transfusions may help replace what has been destroyed. But we're talking about a blast in Manhattan and perhaps hundreds of thousands of people in need of those treatments. Most likely, many hospitals have been leveled along with all the other buildings and most medical professionals are either dead or injured. So we're working against the clock in a healthcare system that is severely strained both the personnel and the infrastructure. Now, let me tell you why the hospital is leveled and what that means for many of our victims. Within a two kilometer radius, all buildings would likely be destroyed. And we'll assume that virtually no one survives inside this area. Right. So immediately after a thermal pulse burns everything within 11 kilometers of ground zero, and ionizing radiation zaps those closer to ground zero, we have a bubble of superheated and super compressed air around it that's now expanding explosively, faster than the speed of sound. Effectively, a powerful shockwave of rapidly expanding air that propagates outward at, yes, the speed of sound and levels everything in its path. Most major buildings within a kilometer of the fireball are just ground up down to their base. Only steel reinforced concrete is able to partially resist. As such, this area is characterized by Dr. Wellerstein, if you please. Heavy blast damage. Even skyscrapers are going to be heavily damaged. Concrete buildings are going to be damaged. So that's not a great area for survival either. And a shock wave that can level a skyscraper reinforced with steel beams does not bode well for the human body. For those directly exposed to said blast, we're talking about a uniform application of blunt force trauma across all exposed body surfaces. However, this is quite different than blunt force trauma applied by a solid object. Since air pressure can prop propagate through air or other materials, and thus it continues to move through the body. You heard that right. 
The human body is not a solid barrier to the shock waves. Rather, it transmits the pressure change through its tissue, organs, and fluids. And since the energy of the shock wave is distributed equally across all surfaces at the same time, there is reduced likelihood of broken bones, though it could cause them as well. The softer tissues of the body and internal organs are in the greatest danger. This high pressure pulse passes through the body, can be felt by the individual, and has been measured inside the intact skull. Dr. Daniel Pearl, professor of pathology at Uniform Services University, has studied blast injuries in soldiers returning from combat, many of whom presented with a particular scarring pattern in their brain tissue. Here, Dr. Pearl holds an image of a healthy brain versus a brain damaged by a blast. Although his research doesn't include patients exposed to an 800 kiloton nuclear blast, the mechanism by which blast damage is caused is the same. The pattern of the scarring was at the interface between structures of different density, fluid and brain, blood and brain, gray matter and white matter. Literally, every blood vessel and organ, bone and muscle, even individual cells share a boundary with a structure of different density. Biophysicists tell us that this is where the energy of the blast wave is released as it passes through different densities. Technically speaking, the passing shock wave creates a rapid increase and decrease in air pressure inside the body. Injuries that occur by this mechanism are known as blast overpressure injury, which can affect any number of vital structures. Hollow organs are most susceptible. The lungs, for example, with conditions like pneumothorax, a collapsed lung, and pulmonary contusion, or a bruising of lung tissue. The gastrointestinal tract and stomach are also at increased risk. The compressible nature of air or gas-filled spaces in these organs allows them to be compressed and can amplify the amount of pressure released. Hollow structures that are not filled with air or gas, such as the heart and circulatory system, with approximately 60,000 miles of hollow tubing, arteries, veins, and capillaries that extend throughout the body have relatively thinner walls compared to solid organs, leaving them vulnerable as well. But who am I kidding? The blast wave would still be powerful enough to disrupt solid organs like the liver, kidneys, or spleen. Ruptures or lacerations may occur, causing them to malfunction and bleed internally. And as we've already mentioned, the brain and central nervous system are also at risk. And traumatic brain injury, very, very likely. Even the ears, which are extra sensitive to changes in air pressure, basically just everywhere. The combination of all the aforementioned factors is why overpressure injury alone can cause immediate death with full body disruption near the point of origin and immediate death without apparent injury due to damage to internal hollow or solid organs. So warns this presentation made by the folks at the OrthoClips YouTube channel. They go on to explain that there's pressure gradients that generate high tensile and shear stresses that are sufficient to traumatically amputate limbs from the blast wave itself. Horrifying. But chances are victims close enough for the blast wave to tear them limb from limb would be within the vaporization range, instantly succumbing to heat radiation before the wave could work its magic. There is, however, high likelihood the body is knocked backwards forcefully away from the explosion by the blast wave, especially for those in the heavy blast damage radius. Trees blackened and smoldering from the heat a second before snap like toothpicks. If you're outside, you get tossed away like a grain of dust in a tornado. And swept away in a tsunami of rubble and debris, as depicted with cartoonish charm by Kurzgesagt here. The speed at which the person is flung or dragged would depend on their distance from the blast and what structures stand between them and the blast wave, among other factors. Even a conservative estimate of five or so meters per second would put them in a position to fall or collide with something behind them and hit their head, land awkwardly, and break a bone. And let's not forget, we are in Manhattan, where falling rubble, flying debris, and vehicles would be widespread. There is also an event known as underpressure, which occurs after the overpressure wave passes and a brief moment of lower pressure creates a partial vacuum, pulling air and debris back towards the detonation point. That means debris flying potentially in all directions at once. Infinite opportunities for injury. The shock wave weakens as it travels outwards, but still about 175 square kilometers of houses collapse like they're made of cards. Here, Kurzgesagt is referring to the moderate blast damage radius, where danger is still widespread. Don't be fooled by the term weaker. 
It's only weaker in relation to the heavy blast damage range and still carries incredible power. This is enough to knock down a wooden house, but not knock down a concrete build, equivalent to a massive earthquake, tsunami, a hurricane, or something along those lines. A massive earthquake, tsunami, or hurricane. I told you the word weaker was relative. Earthquake, yep, we're, we're having, having an earthquake. earthquake. Anything residential with a wooden frame knocked down without more than a moment's notice, leaving people trapped inside under fallen debris. Unfortunately for those trapped inside, said debris is also very hot and fire would be widespread. Trapping tens of thousands of people who didn't have any time to react. Gas stations explode and fires spread throughout the rubble. Need I remind you that everyone within this medium blast damage radius may already be dealing with third degree burns and possibly a dose of ionizing radiation to some degree. When you're trapped in a burning building, the dangers extend far beyond the fire itself. Smoke inhalation is bad as it contains toxic gases and particles that can harm your lungs, make it hard to breathe and even be deadly. Fire can also produce carbon monoxide, a colorless and odorless gas that can poison the body causing symptoms like dizziness, confusion, nausea, and even death. And of course, a hungry fire consumes what? Oxygen. So breathing may not be in the cards. A mushroom cloud made from the remains of the fireball, dust and ash rises kilometers into the sky in the next few minutes. Sounds ominous because it is. This violently pulls in fresh air surrounding the city, destroying more buildings and providing an abundance of oxygen. But you won't be the benefactor of the fresh influx of oxygen. The fire will. If there's enough fuel, fires may turn into a firestorm that burns the rubble, everybody trapped in it, and people trying to flee the devastation. By now you can understand why a college professor once said that the atom bomb killed victims three times. Unprecedented in its ability to kill en masse. Okay. Seriously, I'm starting to feel like a late night infomercial because that's not all folks. But thankfully, this is the turning point in our class where there is a chance that someone's actions may actually improve their likelihood of survival. Up until now, most everything we've covered would feel near instantaneous at the distances described or be too powerful to avoid. Some people in the light blast damage range will have avoided severe burns and maybe if they are lucky, any injury at all. But They've heard the blast and now rush to their windows to take pictures of the mushroom cloud. The only reason a person would do this is because they are unaware that the shockwave is still coming at them, about to shatter their windows and create a blizzard of sharp glass. But now, in the case of nuclear war, you know better. Get down. During the Cold War, this commercial was in circulation. When danger threatened him, he never got hurt. He knew just what to do. The turtle's name is Bert, for those wondering, and his specialty is duck and cover, duck and cover, duck and cover. In the case of those at the window, this will help them avoid lacerations all over the body. This may seem simple and even trivial, but Dr. Wellerstein assures us, we actually even have some evidence that these kinds of things helped at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And in fact, this is where the government got a lot of the data from. Don't worry, the horrific irony is not lost on Dr. W. As sort of unpleasant as that can sound, uh, for talking about what kinds of measures would save your life. But we've come this far, so here's what they found. They looked at the rates of injury and death from people who were inside a building versus outside, for people who ducked down, who stood next to the window. If the worst ever happens and you're in a situation that permits you to take some cover, then do so. Even lying prone on the ground could increase chances of survival. We have this amazing account. This was a survivor's account of Hiroshima. They had been trained to essentially duck and cover whenever they saw a flash. Of course, neither this man nor anyone else knew anything about the atomic bomb at that time. B, he had learned to duck and cover when he saw a flash in defense of any nearby explosive. But because that's a good thing to do if you have an explosion in general. So the weapon went off and he ducked and covered the back of his head and he survived. No injuries. Dr. Wellerstein goes on to say, obviously he was at a distance in which that was survivable. On the other hand, these people in the car there, they all died. They didn't duck and cover. Given his proximity to several victims whose lives were lost, duck and cover is not a trivial piece of advice. Coincidentally, there is one more equally simple thing survivors can do that will help them navigate the fourth and final danger presented by the nuclear explosion. But first, 
Let me set the scene. Interns, meet residual radiation, AKA nuclear fallout, which is so called because it literally falls out of the mushroom cloud or atmosphere as it blows around. Radioactive particles produced by the explosion can mix with non-radioactive materials in the atmosphere, such as dust, water vapor, and other particles to create fallout. Tiny, invisible, but extremely dangerous particles released into the air. Evidently, these particles can travel long distances carried by the wind until they eventually fall back to the ground like dust, emitting harmful radiation all the while. The mechanism of injury caused by the ionizing radiation from fallout is similar to the ionizing radiation pulse emitted by the initial nuclear blast. Both sources of ionizing radiation can damage human tissue by interacting with atoms and molecules in the body, leading to ionization and disruption of cellular structures, including DNA. That's right. These invisible particles can still cause acute radiation syndrome, cutaneous radiation, and burns. All the way to Connecticut? Get me out of here. And although both fallout and the initial pulse emit ionizing radiation, fallout remains dangerous for much longer. You see, the pulse from earlier is a rapid release of energy caused by the intense nuclear reactions that dissipates when the explosion stops. In contrast, fallout particles contain radioactive isotopes that emit radiation over an extended period of time due to the process of radioactive decay. Depending on the specific isotopes present, Fallout can remain hazardous for days, weeks, months, or even years. In fact, the ongoing danger and radioactivity associated with the Chernobyl disaster are primarily due to the release of radioactive materials into the environment, including both short-lived and long-lived isotopes. In his video entitled, Why Isn't Hiroshima a Nuclear Wasteland? Kyle Hill expertly explains why Hiroshima is different. The burst that leveled Hiroshima in 1945 began half a kilometer above the city. As did ours. Crucially, however, the fireball did not touch the ground. And since our simulation was over 700 kilotons larger than Hiroshima, ours did. Even though it too was technically an airburst. Had we adjusted for the size of the bomb and detonated further up, our simulation would have mirrored Hiroshima in regards to fallout, where there was not a vast amount of dirt and vaporized debris for radioactive particles to attach to and fall out of the sky with. In fact, Kyle goes on to explain that by the time the particles in the cloud at Hiroshima began to fall out, they had already decayed enough and become diffuse enough to pose no long-term radiological danger to downwind population. He goes into greater detail in his video, but we've heard enough for our purposes. And unfortunately then, our simulation carries with it the possibility of longer term contamination, especially along the path of the fallout. What the government worries about a lot in this situation? What with this massive invisible trail of radioactive fallout? Is that a bomb would go off and people down around here would say, time to get out of here, head for the hills, and they'd get in their car. Inevitably, with millions of New Yorkers fleeing the site of terrible disaster. You're gonna get into a traffic jam going to be stuck. Your car offers you no protection from radioactivity. None. This is one of the main reasons why it's very difficult to accurately predict injuries and casualties. Add to this that NukeMap or any other model predicts what could happen, but that spread of fallout contamination is dependent upon the wind and weather on the day of the explosion. God forbid it's a windy day. Then perhaps the number of casualties and amount of slow necrotic suffering increases by the millions. This is why the government has advised that we get inside, stay inside. Being an inside a building is always better than being outside a building. Today, we're gonna take a look at a concrete bunker that a do-it-yourselfer did underneath his own house. Just kidding. But if I were trapped inside, surrounded by a landslide full of radioactive particles, a nice comfy bunker with months worth of supplies wouldn't be all that bad. All there really is to do in a situation like this is to avoid contaminated items like the plague and wait to be rescued. It may be some time before the government is able to enact evacuation procedures in earnest, especially for survivors in the city wreckage. Countless people are trapped in collapsed buildings like in earthquakes or blinded by the flash, deaf from the blast wave and unable to flee. And as they emerge, there is the chance they are met with this. An awful black rain can begin, with radioactive ash and dust descending on the city, covering everything and everyone. By now, it should be crystal clear just how terrible these weapons actually are. But if this lesson is a camel, then we've got one more straw. 
from surrounding cities will have a hard time entering the disaster zone. Even if they can, the radioactive contamination will make it risky to get too close. In reality, it may be a long time, days even, before victims can get the medical attention they desperately need. So maybe we just don't use these weapons anymore? My heart goes out to all of those who suffered at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, as well as to their families. I'd like to take a moment to give credit to all the creators whose work appeared in today's lesson. I've watched a Time Magazine article where many survivors share their testimony. Among them, Sakiko Matsuo, now 86, reminded readers, peace is our number one priority.